Hello, everybody. You are listening to Through Time and Clades. My name is Albert. I am Joan. And we are finally back uh, for another episode. Um, yeah, we took a, a short break, uh, mostly because we've been busy. Um, and I guess we can probably talk a little bit about what we've been busy with. But, um, you know, in general, um, before we jump in, how are you doing? Um, I honestly can't complain. Uh, I have honestly just been, you know, keeping up with usual things at home since the last time that we recorded. Um keeping up with media, with family, that sort of things, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, during this episode uh, fairly soon. Um, one thing that became apparent to me today, uh, like literally like just today, like before we started recording, hmm. um, it is apparently Steve Irwin Day today. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, which, is a, which is a holiday that was set up um, following his unfortunate passing back in 2006 right um and uh yeah gosh i uh i have a lot of feelings about steve Irwin. you know uh, he he was i mean i know we throw this word around a lot but he was a, a childhood icon mm -hmm. for sure i mean i used to watch the crocodile hunter and crocodile diaries uh, all the time growing up and just his enthusiasm and spirit for you know all of nature even the parts that a lot of folks would take issue with, you know, the snakes and scorpions and crocodiles. Mm -hmm. Like, he, he gave them as much love as most folks would give dogs and cats. Um, in some cases, literally, because, you know, he was going out and, you know, grabbing these animals and putting them to the camera. Look how gorgeous this thing is. It's right, amazing. Right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bush fight book. And, you know, you, you fall in love with every single one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's easy to forget that. You know, regardless of how you feel about Steve Rowan and his presentation approach, because mm -hmm. goodness knows a lot of people did, right. um, the dude was a genuine published herpetologist. Like, mm -hmm. you can go on Google Scholar, and there's his name with other you know herpetologist coworkers, you know, making papers about crocodiles and and and, and reptile diversity. And uh, I mean, like knowing that later in life, even after his passing, which uh, I would have been. 12 years old, I believe, when that happened. Uh, it's a very vivid memory. Um, it kind of adds a whole new dimension and appreciation to the show. Because, you know, a lot of presenters for shows like this, you know, they're, they might be like, you know, naturalists, you know, or, or nature enthusiasts. But here was a man who actually kind of went through much of the process that you know, all scientists go through, or at least many scientists go through, you know, go, going through academia and, and having the academic knowledge in the background that he can bring into his sort of more showman type presentation approach. And I don't know, it just, it makes me feel so much better about that. <laughs> um, and certainly I appreciate him even more now than I did when I was younger. And uh, gosh, you know, like he went young too. I can only wonder, like, where we would be at now if he was able to, you know, bypass that unfortunate accident and and keep on presenting wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, at the very least, uh, it seems his children are really picking up the mantle. And uh, even now they have the, the new show. Um, what is it? It's like Crikey, It's the Irwins or something like that, where <laughs> it's a family life at the Australia Zoo, which, you know, they had founded. Um, and run for many years and uh, yeah his spirit is definitely there throughout that entire show and uh, it's very clear that his family has kept on his legacy as much as they could um, and so I always wish them the best whenever I can mm. and uh, so it's kind of nice that we have this holiday and we can remember him and uh, I don't know maybe I'll go I'll go dig through my DVD collection mm -hmm. so I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I have the movie that he did um, you know, before he had passed, of course, um, yeah. which was, I don't remember a lot from it. I know it's not really well liked nowadays because it's kind of silly yeah. and hokey. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's one of those things where, like, when you're a kid, you don't really have a lot of those feelings. Right. right. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I should he take heed. Because if I watch it again, I end up disliking it more. Now that I'm older, I feel like it's going to tarnish a lot of memories that I had. Um, ooh, decisions, decisions. 
Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, <laughs> yeah, not not a whole lot to report on my end. Um, how about you? How have you been doing? Um, yeah, I would say I'm doing pretty well. The main thing, uh, I guess, uh, the main event uh, that's happened to me over the last couple months um, is uh, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology Conference, mm -hmm. which uh, happens every year. And this year it took place in Cincinnati. Uh, it is basically like the big conference in my field. It was a lot of fun. Um, I, I had a good time. I gave a talk about my research uh, and it went well. Uh, I, I was told, uh, in fact, by certain people that it was the best conference talk I've ever given. I don't know if I would personally think so, but uh, well, I, I'm glad people liked it. And this year was a pretty packed one in terms of like things I'm interested in, I guess, because there were so many sessions dedicated to dinosaurs this year that you could have gone like almost the entire conference um, just attending dinosaur talks and like you you could get away with it basically um, I guess to, to people who aren't in vertebrate paleontology that might sound weird because you're like yeah, of course there are a lot of dinosaur talks who study vertebrate paleontology like, what else is are, are you going to talk about but dinosaurs are not necessarily the group with the greatest percentage of paleontologists studying them in, even even within the relatively small field of uh, vertebrate paleontology like uh, mammals uh, have many more people studying them and there were a lot of mammal sessions uh, i guess a typical number uh, of dinosaur sessions would be maybe four sessions in recent years um but this year there were four sessions on just theropod dinosaurs alone now, i think there were two other dinosaur sessions um so yeah six six dinosaur sessions in total you could have gone through basically the entire conference uh just just attending the dinosaur sessions and something i was really cool about uh, this year's svp was that the organizing committee actually arranged with the cincinnati zoo and also with the um, the cincinnati museum uh, which is a, which is a big complex like com comprising several uh different museums um basically during the conference period if you were a conference attendee, you could go to one of these institutions, just show them your, your name badge, and they'll let you in for free. Uh, and so I ended up going to the zoo twice to, in order to see everything. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It's just, the Cincinnati Zoo is not huge, but it's it's pretty rich, like, it, like rich in terms of like its exhibits. Um, there are quite a large diversity of, of species, some, some of which uh, I had rarely or, or never seen before. Uh, so that was very cool. But uh, yeah, I think if you're interested in hearing about how my SVP experience went uh, in more detail, uh, I wrote a, a brief blog post uh, about it. So I'll try to remember to link that in the description. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was good. It went well, at least for me. Sadly, um, this year they did not have a mask mandate. And so quite a large proportion of people ended up getting COVID after they got back from SVP. Um, now, I, I was lucky, so uh, as, as you might recall, I got COVID um, after SAPI, uh, the Society of Avian Paleontology and Evolution Conference uh, earlier this year, uh, but uh, I, I was lucky and I, I was wearing a mask anyway and, uh, and did, did not um, contract COVID during SVP, but I, I know a lot of people who did. Um, so yeah, you know, be careful. Uh, um, it, is, it is still best practice to wear a mask in public, especially indoor spaces. Um, and I, I hope SVP will at least consider like implementing a, a mask mandate in future years because I, you know, <laughs> the way things are going, COVID is not going anywhere anytime soon. And it protects you from other diseases as well. So yeah, it's kind of kind of a kind of a no-brainer, really. Anyways, yeah, I think other than that, mostly just busy with the usual things. I I say I'm busy with you know research meetings, uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, plugging along um, with various projects, um, which I'll share as they are completed, whatever that is. I think that's that's really it for my personal updates. Do you have anything to add before we move on? Well, I guess if we move on, I can add something. Sure. Because uh, I've, I've been purposely saving this for sort of uh, our updates slash, you know, natural history media coverage that we have really tended to do a lot on this show. Yeah. Um, so if we move to the next slide. Um, so, yeah, um, as usual, we've been getting a lot of uh, natural history content um, from uh, 
the TV sphere in recent months. Um, I think it was actually on the day that we last recorded, which would have been the 27th of September, that PBS in the U.S. had started airing um, its version of Chris Packham's Earth, which had was which was a BBC production um, that had aired. Uh, it was like a month or two prior, if I remember correctly. Um, and so this is the this is the American version uh, where they've uh, removed Chris Packham and they have instead gotten a narrator along with a huge panel of diverse paleontologists from across the you know uh, paleontological community and, and all fields um, to kind of be the presenters of the series, um, which they call Ancient Earth which is certainly a far better and more appropriate way of handling the title of a show than just calling it BBC Earth. Um, <laughs> right. Goodness knows Googling that, that's going to be a bit of a problem. But uh, gosh, um, I don't want to talk too much about that because I want to focus on uh, life on our planet. But I will say that I was very pleased with Ancient Earth. Um, I think it's a very beautifully done documentary in a lot of respects. Um, it's a good introduction to some of the really like old events in deep time because really the first like three episodes or so spend a lot of time in the Precambrian and uh, Paleozoic era uh, which is very difficult to find in a lot of paleo media you're really getting some of the bare bones like structural foundations of the planet in this series um, some of the, like the really old events, like Snowball Earth, which get the whole episode, um, just fairly well done. Um, I have a couple of critiques here and there, but I don't think this is the place to talk about them right now. Um, what I really want to do is focus on life on our planet. So we've brought this up a couple of times in the past episodes because you know we try to keep up with you know when new shows are going to come out and uh, and, and when press releases arrive. You know we usually like like to give our two cents. Um, so this dropped in on Netflix um, on October 25th, and uh, I started watching it the day that it came out, um, which actually was kind of interesting because that was also the date of the last of the episodes for Ancient Earth. Hmm. So when that finished airing on TV, I hopped right over to Netflix and I picked up on this one. <laughs> hmm. So I, I, I had a little impromptu paleo night in that case. Um, now, in the interest of fairness, I am not going to give a huge deep dive episode by episode, like look at this um, series for now. One, simply because Albert here has not seen any of it, like in full. Um, at most, you've seen like clips and things, and yeah. I know I've gone on and on about it with you, like in, in our personal conversations. <laughs> um, but like, you have not watched a single episode. So I, I don't think it would be fair for us to do a, a, a through time and clades like breakdown of the series, at least just yet, um, if we want to do that to begin with, because there's a lot of media that we'd love to do that approach with, mm. uh, of course, um, at least in the future. Um, so I'll just give some of my brief, as spoiler free as possible thoughts. Um, I know we had our reservations about this series. The more we heard about it as the, release date was approaching. Um, we heard that the CGI elements are going to be very few. It was mainly going to feature wildlife footage. Um, the framing of you know the, the battle for survival, as you can see here in the in one of the <laughs> release posters, um, yeah. really threw us off. You know, the, the overemphasis on competition and and and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I was very hesitant. But it's new paleo content um, with a goal to educate. And so I was still very intrigued and I wanted to see for myself and, and you know, I had my fingers crossed that maybe I would be pleasantly surprised. Mm. Um, and I'm happy to announce that at least on my end of things, I was very pleased with this series. Um, I think that even barring the approach where this battle for survival is really framed almost like a great drama. Um, clades of organisms are called dynasties and there's a lot of rising and falling that we see throughout the series as 
different groups of organisms come into prominence in the fossil record and appear to kind of take over as rulers of the earth in many respects. Um, there's a lot of that there. I, I think the weakest element of the series is the script and how it handles that thing. But in terms of an introduction into deep time and the history of life on earth, I think this is very solid. The direction that it used with the modern wildlife footage, I think was very fitting. It did not distract from the CGI elements. In fact, it actually helped them in a lot of ways. And I'm very much reminded of a number of earlier series, like as I was watching this. Um, so uh, the Velvet Claw, which is, I want to say an early 90s documentary. Yeah. Um, I think so. About the history of, yeah, about the history of carnivorans. So that's the dogs, cats, bears, seals, weasels, hyenas group of mammals. Mm -hmm. um, that was a series that, that followed that group. And that featured a lot of modern wildlife footage. But it was interspersed with these beautifully done, um, traditionally animated sequences showing some of the fossil groups uh, of, of this clade, you know, the saber toothed cats and uh, the bear dogs, for example. Um, in, in a very nice sketchy style. And it used that to help explain the evolution of these groups and tie in very closely to like how the modern species evolved. Um, so I think that approach it, it came into a lot of play here in Life on Our Planet. You know, you, you would get the, the sequences in deep time where they're showing various extinct animals. And then they would use those as framing devices to talk about the different quote unquote dynasties or clades of organisms. So like in one episode, they introduce arthropods by showing a arthropleura, which was a giant relative of millipedes that lived during the Carboniferous period. It was one of the largest arthropods that ever lived. And you, know, you, you get a very basic, you know, life history of the animal, like, you know, typical behaviors. Um, and then it jumps into like a montage of like modern arthropods highlighting all of their features and what makes them distinct from other organisms. And then it goes into footage uh, of modern arthropod behaviors. So that approach of prehistoric behaviors, catalog of the clade, modern behaviors is shown a lot throughout the series. And I think it's a very nice way of introducing biodiversity in that approach. Um, and as far as the CGI sequences go, they're a pretty mixed bag. Um, it's very clear, based on what I've read and seen from promotional material, that they really tried their best in terms of accurately reconstructing these animals and putting them in their environments. Um, in some cases, they've gone out into nature and filmed the backgrounds for these sequences. And other times they've gone from the ground up and built them on the computer. So that way they could be more, I guess, fitting accuracy wise. For example, uh, there are Jurassic sequences that are, uh, and, and Cretaceous sequences that were all built digitally on the computer to place the animals in. Um, and speaking of which, what was interesting to me was that this series, like there is a vertebrate bias in a lot of ways. I think that's hard to dis that's hard to escape from. I know we talked a little bit about this with our, uh, our, our friend Meg, um, but surprisingly, the show does not focus heavily on dinosaurs and mammalian megafauna. I was surprised at how little of that content there was in this series. I think it's appropriate how they really tried to break up a lot of these episodes depending on like the period of time they were looking at mm. um one of the most dramatic examples of this was their mesozoic episode it was like in the shadow of giants or something like that and like yeah they, they introduced the episode they show you know big jurassic dinosaurs hunting and, and you know being dinosaurs but then like for the remainder of the episode you're seeing all of these other small organisms that had evolved at the same time so you're getting mammal evolution, you're getting snake evolution, you're getting flowering plants, you're getting new social insects, you're getting life in the oceans, um, you know, modern coral reefs. Um, it, and that's like the majority of that episode. 
there were maybe only like two sequences with dinosaurs in the dinosaur episode. <laughs> and the whole thing is just other organisms. And I was really appreciative seeing that. It was a nice change of pace. Mm-hmm. Um, and even like towards the end, that when we entered the Cenozoic and specifically the Quaternary period, um, I think they did that very beautifully. Um, so I think in terms of an introduction to paleontology, you know, as a means for people to be introduced into evolution of life, I think life on our planet is a pretty good contender. Hmm. I wouldn't say it's perfect. I think it's asking a lot for something like this to be perfect. Um, of course, that's another conversation to be had too. You know, the <laughs> standards for paleo documentaries nowadays. That there's a there's a lot of discourse about that, to say the least. Um, but I think this is a pretty fine documentary, and uh, Morgan Freeman does a good job narrating. Um, they had a huge consultant list hmm. for each episode. Each episode was different too. Um, they had different people coming in to you know get the look of the animals and the backgrounds and the information just right. Which again, you know, there are issues here and there. There are some pretty blatant inaccuracies and. In, uh, some of the recycling of models from Jurassic World, which was confirmed, was a bit more obvious than I would have liked. Mm-hmm. But I, I'd say that that was a very small percentage of this documentary. All in all, I think it's very fine, and it does what it sets out to do, um, and does it in a very engaging and beautiful way. I mean, certainly we're at an age now where if you want to get quality CGI with you know the type of wildlife footage that we're getting nowadays that that high definition you know high speed stuff that we're so used to seeing and combine that together in a documentary oh my god this was beautiful this was beautiful to look at um and and just it really complements the actual like scientific material as well it's just a spectacle um and i i, I guess this is a long way of saying i really enjoyed this series and uh I really want to see it again. Mm-hmm. And I really want them to put this on Blu-ray too. I know that's asking a lot, um, but it's not unheard of. Because I, I just, I gosh, I want to, I want to be able to like look at this more and uh, introduce more people to it, which I have. I'm happy to say I, uh, I caught wind from some, some from some, some close friends of mine who have like a casual interest in paleontology. And they had caught wind of the series and asked me about it, and I gave them my two cents, and they're on board. They want to check it out, too. <laughs> um, so I can at least confirm that it's reaching people. Um, in fact, I think last I checked, it was like the 10th most popular like show, period, on Netflix for like a period of time in, in the last week or so. Um, so it's getting there. It's reaching people. And at the end of the day, I think that's what I would like to see. Um, so at the end of the day, like these documentaries are not just made for the paleo nerds and, and researchers like us. You know, it's they're for everyone. Everybody, everyone should enjoy it. And uh, based on what I'm hearing, I'm seeing a lot of positive reception from it on that angle. But uh, yeah, uh, again, Albert, I know you've only seen a little bit from this series, but uh, I'm curious as to your response. What do you think of my assessment? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> not having seen the series, it's not like I can really comment on much, but um, I, I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed it. Um, I, I would say overall, the reception that I've been hearing has been mixed. Um, so there there are definitely positive ones like yours, uh, but uh, I, I, I've definitely seen people who still still don't seem to be quite fans of some of the ways in which the series did things. Um, so. I suppose eventually I'll have to check it out and, and judge it for myself. Um, but uh, it is good to hear that uh, at least some of our concerns um, were alleviated by by the final product, at least somewhat. So yeah, I, I mean, I, had, I don't think there's much else I can I can really say, um, at least uh, off the top of my head. Um, but uh, do we want to talk about the other series that is pictured on this slide? Yeah. Um, so I understand that. Since we last recorded, um, Planet Earth 3 had aired, and I don't think it's finished airing yet, Mm -hmm. but uh, you had a couple things you wanted to say about it. I I guess so, yeah. Uh, So yeah, we're we're kind of um, in an opposite situation here, because Planet Earth 3 has been 
uh, releasing weekly episodes uh, over the last few weeks uh, over here in the UK. Uh, but as I understand, it's probably not available legally uh, to watch in the States yet. So I assume you haven't seen it. I, I won't go into too much detail, partly because you haven't seen it and also uh, because uh, it, it hasn't finished airing, as you said. Uh, I think as of the time recording, four episodes have, have aired. Uh, and I have seen three of them so far. I haven't seen the most recent one yet, but uh, I definitely plan to. And uh, without going into too much detail, uh, I, I will say that, yeah, this very much follows in the footsteps of what we expect to see from BBC Landmark documentary series. Um just incredible footage of wildlife and in many cases uh, not just rehashing uh, species or behaviors that have already been the subject of documentaries before, but uh, kind of going the extra mile to include a lot of novel uh, information and, um, and spectacle. Um, so I, I've, been, I've been quite impressed by uh, what I've seen so far uh, of the series. Um, and I guess something that's, uh, that stands out is that, you know, over, over the years, especially in recent times, it, these BBC landmark documentaries have gradually, you know, been trending towards acknowledging and incorporating more material uh, discussing kind of anthropogenic impacts on wildlife, so they, uh, because some of the criticisms of earlier BBC documentaries was that they kind of just showed the natural world as this, you know, pristine state and uh, did, did really discuss the actual uh, threats that many of them are facing and sometimes very severe and immediate threats that they are facing um, due to uh, human activity. Um, and so gradually they, they've started to incorporate more and more uh, of this aspect. Uh, I know like for a while, like they, they would maybe add an extra episode to the end of the series discussing this specific uh, topic. That, that's what they did for some of the, some of the recent series. Even more recently, they've started to kind of integrate the uh, human related stuff even more into their uh kind of main series episodes so they they have like individual segments in in many of the episodes like fe featuring human impacts on wildlife and uh that is very much the case in this particular series so uh you'll, you'll definitely see a lot more um, segments where uh there are humans on screen or or showing the direct impacts humans have on other animals and in fact uh they haven't aired some of these episodes yet but from the titles that they've revealed of their their episodes it seems that they're gonna have several that are gonna be primarily focusing on you know kind of human wildlife uh interactions or uh, relationships um because so far, the episodes that they've aired are like the usual Planet Earth style, like habitat based episodes. So I think they've had uh, um, coasts, oceans, um, desert and grassland in one episode, uh, freshwater, which is the most recent one. But um, in their episode list, one of their future episodes, for example, is I think it's it's supposed to focus on urban habitats, like cities. Um, and uh, there's, I think, another episode that's just titled Heroes. So I think that's that's going to be about conservationists specifically. Um, so that that is really interesting. It, it is really interesting how much they're integrating that into um, the series. And uh, overall, I, I would say that it, that's a good thing. Uh, I think it's good to to raise awareness of of these issues. And um, like like we've kind of kind of mentioned before on the show, uh, it is kind of fallacious to uh, depict humans as being you know, completely separate or distanced from the natural world, because that's simply not the case. We we, we are part of the, the natural world as well. Um, and we have a very, very uh, large impact um, across pretty much all of it. So um, I think it is it is fair uh, and important, I think, to emphasize the, these kinds of um, connections. And in doing so, I, I don't think they really take away from the, the interesting wildlife uh, behaviors and footage that they that they do end up featuring, because uh, there's plenty of those um, that, that do not feature uh, humans directly either. But um, it's just that they're, they're kind of emphasizing the human element more. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, overall, I, I I am pretty pleased uh, with what I've seen so far. Uh, as usual, I mean, sure, there there are there are the little things that might bother me about the the script, or um, uh, or may, maybe some some of the choices in what animals they feature, uh, but those those would be like extremely minor uh, critiques, um, to say the least. Uh, I, I think overall this. The series um, very much follows in the footsteps of the the series that came came before it uh, in similar vein, and so I, I think if you enjoyed previous Planet Earth series uh, or or similar BBC landmark documentary series, um, you definitely will uh, get something out of Planet Earth three, and I look forward to seeing the rest of it. <laughs> it's supposed to come out to the states fairly soon. I, I I feel like I heard something about it, at least maybe by the end of the year. Um, mm. or early next year. Wow, um, that's quick. Yeah. But yeah, I, I wouldn't hold my breath though, because I, <laughs> I, I want to make sure I get the specifics, you know, because uh, in this day and age, release dates get pushed back and pushed forward and mm. delayed all the time. So who knows? Right. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is nice to see that for what is supposed to be the finale of the the. I guess we should call the Planet Earth trilogy. Um, <laughs> from the way things are sounding, they really decided to kind of anchor in the Anthropocene event approach. Because um, even like with the poster here, this is so. This is the cover of the companion book to this series, and right away the subtitle here: "Our World at the Dawn of a New Age." It, it's very blatantly Anthropocene focused. Right. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely echo what you said. I, I, I like that more and more and more these series are really trying to incorporate um, this material. Uh, I was struck on a rewatch the other day of Seven Worlds, One Planet. Hmm. You know, as I was doing my usual work, I would have it on in the background. How almost at the end of like each sequence, like they would make sure to put like a little side about the state of that habitat or organism, right, right. You know, like this organism is very rare or human encroachment has been threatening this habitat, things like that. Um, so like, even like just a few years ago, like they were really like punctuating more and more of these series with it. Um, so now to see this where they have apparently more than one episode now where they're like specifically looking at conservation issues and the environmental crisis. Um, I'm very pleased to hear that. And uh, I'm curious, like, what they're going to include and what their overall messaging is going to be. Right. Um, especially as I, I read more about conservation issues in the wider world. Um, there's certainly a lot of nuance and complication with the sort of top than what you might hear um, in the news. So, uh, yeah, I am. Um, gosh, I'm also just really happy that we're at an age now where we're getting documentaries like these. I mean. I think about when I was younger, like the first Planet Earth, or even something like Walking with Dinosaurs, you know, what that did for me growing up to, to introduce me further to the natural world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's kids that are going to be the age that we were when we first saw those series mm -hmm. that are going to be looking at shows like this. Yeah. And who knows what this will do for them in the way that it did for us. It's, uh, it's important and necessary. And, uh, uh, it just fills me with really good feelings. But it's good to hear that uh, you've been enjoying the series so far. Um, yeah, hopefully um, we can talk more about these in the future. Again, I don't know if we will dedicate entire episodes looking at to these specific series, but uh, we're definitely always trying to keep up to date with natural history media, and we'll always let you all know when the newest things are coming out soon so you can prepare to watch along with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well in that case uh, was there anything else you wanted to add Albert before we moved on to our stories uh, no I don't think so okay so uh, as we alluded to before uh, we're following the two month format this time around so Albert and I will both feature uh, our news stories from each month so I'm going to have one from September and from October Albert will do the same and we'll kind of alternate in our discussions of those so I think if we move to the next slide, uh, I have the first story. Um, so this is my September story. And 
as I was setting up this episode and planning things with Alb here, um, a kind of funny thing happened in terms of my story selection. Hmm. So um, this story is going to follow a very similar theme to my later October story. Um, and that is concerning the sort of lockstep evolution of organisms with their environments. Uh, and in the former case here, we're going to first look at mammalian teeth, um, which is, you know, a big subject in paleomammalogy. Um, so when scientists discuss the skeletal anatomy of mammals, they will use many different terms to refer to the shape and function of their teeth. So for example, uh, carnivorous mammals with uh, sharp slicing molars for gnawing on flesh and bone are said to have carnassial teeth. And herbivorous mammals with grinding molars that sport tough enamel ridges are said to have lophodont teeth. Well, during the late Miocene epoch, this would have been between 11.6 and 5.3 million years ago, there were a number of herbivorous mammal clades that evolved hypsodont teeth, meaning that their tooth crowns became higher with more and tougher enamel. And this is a trend that we see across many groups, such as horses, cattle, deer, goats, and even several types of rodents. It has generally been argued that this shift in mammalian dentition corresponded with a great change in global environments when the climate underwent aridification, which encouraged the spread of grasses and then grassland environments, things like savannas and steppes. Now, Blades of grass contain phytolates, which are these tiny bits of silica, which are essentially glass, that provide a sort of passive defense to the plants because it has the ability to wear down tooth enamel over time through grazing. But it is also true that grass tends to grow in kind of gritty and dusty soils, and those that grit and dust can also have the same effect on teeth so it has currently been debated whether one or the other or both was responsible for the evolutionary shift towards hypsodont molars Mm -hmm. because by adding higher enamel the teeth of herbivorous mammals can last much longer as they graze they don't have to worry about wearing down all their teeth and not being able to eat anything anymore um so proboscideans and this is the clay that includes the elephants and their vast array of extinct relatives, things like mastodons, they are among the groups of mammals that evolved this sort of new teeth during the Miocene. So all three of the living species today are considered to have hypsodont teeth, although in their case, uh, they can also be considered to have the lophodont condition because their molars are studded with many ridges. If the fossil record is anything to go by, it seems that different clades of elephants uh, and that's a name that we're going to use to refer to a clade within proboscidea called Elephanta Day. Uh, they have adapted their molars in convergent ways during a period of between 10 and 7 million years. So, Juha Serinen and Adrian M. Lister wanted to explore this period of proboscidean history to better understand the specific relationships between climate change, environmental shifts, and the evolution of dentition so they could test what specifically facilitated you know, the arrival of hypsodont condition in these organisms. So to do this, the duo first collected mesoware data from about 30 species of elephants and their older relatives, uh, specifically within the African paleontological sites, going back about 26 million years. So from the time when there were more like shrubby and bushy vegetation and onwards to more grassland environments. You can actually really see the shift in motion. Um, So, of course, this uh, collection of species includes the two living African elephants, uh, that being the bush elephant, so that's Loxodonta africana, and the forest elephant, which is Loxodonta cyclotus, which is shown below. Um, These organisms were recently, within the last few decades or so, recognized as their own distinct species. So for a time, it was thought that there were only two kinds of elephants, but now we know that the African bush and African forest elephants have a much deeper history of separate of speciation, and they're actually fairly distinct from each other. And in some cases, they're probably more related to some fossil varieties than they are to each other. That's a subject for another time. Hmm. Um, the team also looked at the earliest species of mammoth, 
So this is Nanifis uh, subplanifrons, which was all likely ancestral to the rest of the mammoths in Eurasia and the Americas. Um, they looked at species in the genus Anancus, which has very uh, remarkably long and horizontally pointing tusks, which must have been fun to deal with. Um, and uh, they also looked at uh, a species in the genus Prodinotherium, which sports downward curving tusks from its lower jaws. Um, and in fact, diverged fairly early on in proboscidean evolution. Um, and as well, they looked at the genus Stetro, uh, Stegotetrabelodon. I got some of these names. Um, that's shown above. Um, these organisms have a parallel pair of tusks in their upper and lower jaws. And wow, they wouldn't look out of place in Middle Earth. Um, so meso wear simply refers to the wear patterns on teeth that can be detected forensically and show what types of vegetation or any other foods had caused the wear in the first place to give clues as to the diet and life, or at least in the time before the animal passed. Um, this is a very frequent method used by paleontologists studying uh, paleo diets in a true sense. Uh, and it seems that to get a full complete picture of the changes in teeth over time, the team also looked at the frequency of the lophodont condition and the thickness of enamel in each of the elephants concerned across time. And in conjunction with all of these tooth samples, the, the team also collected as much data as they could on environmental conditions. Everything from past concentrations of soil carbonates to the types of grass and other floral remains, to the amount of dust flow, uh, to the levels of aridity, and on and on uh, at these same paleontological sites where the elephant remains had been found. And so taking all of this together with an updated phylogeny of proboscideans, the team could then place all this data in a correlated context. That way, all of these changes through time could be compared all together to see say when the aridification ticked up, when the grasslands became widespread, when the changes in dental morphology occurred, and so on. And so if we move to the next slide, we can see just how this looks. And so just real quickly here, uh, I know this is an enormous chart, um, just kind of get you an idea, moving from left to right, um, we have our proboscidean phylogeny here, each of the uh, lineages or AKA families are color coded here. Um, along with some physical representation of the uh, uh, the animals concerned. So there's some of the different genera and species of proboscideans that are uh, explored here. Um, and then we have the mesoware on the teeth, the hypsodont condition, the lophodont count, uh, the, the types of ridges on the teeth, the thickness of the enamel, um, and then on and on to the, uh, the soil concentrations, dust flux, types of grass and foliage. Mm. And you can see these little tiny dots in all of these charts um, are kind of uh, broken down towards the bottom right of this chart. They just kind of show the, the animal sample sizes, the, um, you know, where the fossils are found, some of these environmental reconstructions, where they're indicated here. So that's what, that's what all of this data means here. And as you can see, they're all uh, coordinated to the exact same time intervals. So when it's 26 million years ago, you can see all the data from that period of time and going forward till the present day. And so the results and analysis from this study uh, proved to be quite surprising in a way. The team was able to find an overall trend between the rise in aridification and grasslands with the rise in the hypsodont condition in proboscideans. But there was a little bit of a catch. Based on the mesoware analyses, the changes in African vegetation seem to matter more than, say, dust accumulation due to a drying landscape. In fact, across different lineages of elephants and their kin, the types of vegetation that were consumed didn't really seem to shift so much as increase in variety. So proboscideans seem to have added grasses to their diets of browse, rather than change from browse to grass almost completely as some other herbivorous mammals did. Mm. And in some cases, this was facilitated by a uh, niche specialization. So like there were some proboscideans that were specializing more towards grasses 
um, while still being able to consume like bushes and shrubs. Uh, but in other words, the trends here are very similar across the different species and genera. Proboscideans, it seems, were behaviorally flexible, non-selective feeders, much as they are today. Mm-hmm. An African bush elephant, for example, will eat just about any type of foliage, depending on the context. So be that grasses on the savanna, or scrubs and bushes in the open woodlands, or leaves and bark in desert environments. That members of this clade took to including grass in their diets alongside other plants may also reflect another key observation. So across proboscidea, the members of these different lineages show trends of increasing their overall body mass and scale. Mm-hmm. So mastodons were getting bigger, gompotheres were getting bigger, elephants were getting bigger, until you get to the Pleistocene epoch, when some of these, uh, some of the mammoth species, uh, for example, were among the largest land mammals that ever lived. Uh, they rivaled the Drichotheres of earlier times for scale, mm-hmm. uh, the latter being uh, relatives of the rhinoceros. And yeah, it takes a lot of food to feed an elephant. An average bush elephant ideally needs about 150 kilograms of food a day just to get the nutrients that it needs. So it helps not to be too picky. <laughs> And so uh, on the question of grass silica versus gritty soils in affecting tooth wear, uh, for elephants alone, it seems that the former uh, best explains the mesoware patterns on their teeth than the soil does. That's what the team were able to deduce from the mesoware patterns, that it was really like the grass silica that was pitting these teeth more than the, than the gritty soil was. Mm. And in the grand scheme of things, the data seems to show that, again, the amount of grass in the diet better reflects the dietary mesoware than does the increases in dust associated with aridity. You know, these associations were reflected in the increase of hypsodont type and enamel thickness of the molar teeth. Um, but what's interesting is that we start to see a little bit of diversity in these results, again, going back to that niche specialization. So for some of the proboscideans, hypsodont molars with high ridges seem to have evolved more in line with arid grassland environments, while hypsodont molars with more enamel folding seem to have evolved more in line with increases in grass use alone. And we only find these patterns among the elephantids. One of the results of this data that has seemed fairly clear through recent, uh, through previous research is that the rise and spread of grasslands, at least in Africa, from 10 million years ago and onwards, seems to have led to a decline in loss of other proboscidean lineages. So like the dinotheres and the gonthotheres we've mentioned previously. Uh, Now some types like those in the genus Anantus had made attempts at adapting, involving some changes in their last molars, for example, to better handle the new diets. Um, But these do not appear to have lasted. Uh, lasted much um, was the elephantids by not shifting their palates completely, but instead incorporating grass into their already varied diets. Who would be able to survive in this new, increasingly arid world? And in the end, studies like this really do demonstrate that with the right amount of data across several contexts, researchers like Sarah and Ann Lister can better understand the role of environmental change in the evolution of organisms over time. Um, I want to highlight the abstract because the end of it really perfectly explains this. Quote, our study illustrates how in fossil series with adequate stratigraphic control and proxy data, environmental and behavioral factors can be mapped onto time series of morphological change, illuminating the mode of acquisition of an adaptive complex. So it really seems like for future research, if the data is good enough to use this approach, we could answer, or at least get very close to the answers of a lot of questions regarding the rise of different organisms over time in response to the sorts of great environmental changes that, for example, dried out much of the world during the last 10 million years or so. And so I really had to highlight the study. I thought it was very fascinating. Uh, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so. 
Yeah, I, I heard about the study, although I didn't um, read it in as much detail as as you have. Uh, but I mean, just just from this chart, we can really see how much data they they collected, and um, it's uh, it's really impressive work because I think we are we are often interested in thinking about how the environment has shaped the evolution of different groups of organisms. But it is often very, very difficult to actually demonstrate um, that there is any kind of connection there. Um, and I, I think the um, like the number of variables they looked at here um, and the the types of variables that they choose that they chose, um, I think make makes a pretty good case for the um, the picture that they kind of illustrate here. Um, at the very least, I think you know we we can be pretty confident to that uh, these features of the teeth are likely related to diet, and that uh, there there is a connection between eating different types of plants and and the uh, the specialization of the teeth. These all sound like very reasonable inferences that they have made, um, and as is often the case uh, we find uh, clearly that there is there is a fair bit of complexity going on too it's not just a, it's not just that the entire lineage was all doing one thing as the environment changed right it, uh, as you mentioned like there there's clearly some some spread in in what was going on uh so yeah i i i'm always very interested to see see this kind of study um especially when it can you know shed so much insight or it can it can give us so much insight um on the history of such an iconic group of animals um so a very very fascinating first choice um, of story indeed <laughs> well if there's anything else that you wanted to add um we can move on to your first study i understand it's quite an interesting one uh i suppose so <laughs> yeah let, let's let's go on to that one um all right so uh we're going to talk about a very uh different group of animals uh in this story so we're we're going to talk about mollusks here and i would say that as non-vertebrate animals go or i guess you could say invertebrates as invertebrates go uh mollusks as a group are relatively familiar to us um i think i would say like the three big groups of mollusks that are most familiar to us would be number one, uh, the gastropods, which are the snails, um, which include the various groups that we call slugs because they have lost their shells. Um, then there are the bivalves, so the mollusks with two shells. And so these were, are, you could think of them as the clams, basically, and also including things like scallops and uh, oysters. And then the third major group uh, would be the cephalopods, so things like octopuses and squids. Uh, there is one group today, the, the nautiluses, that have a shell, um, but most of the living cephalopods uh, have either internalized the shell or basically lost the shell. So the, these three groups of mollusks are um, are pretty familiar, and in, in fact. Uh, there are probably quite quite a few of us who who eat members of all, all three of these groups uh, on a regular basis, um, and and are therefore very familiar with them on our uh, dinner plates. Um, but despite how familiar and how kind of um, you know valuable in a way uh, mollusks are to us, surprisingly, there's quite a lot that we don't really know about their their evolution and uh kind of like when we mentioned when we talked about uh pan crustaceans or you could just say crustaceans um in in our last news episode there's a there's a surprising amount of controversy when it comes to um trying to figure out the phylogeny of mollusks of the big of the uh, major living mollusk groups um because we're not really sure how these three major uh, lineages, the bivalves, uh, gastropods, and cephalopods are related to each other. Recent studies have given us quite different results. Um, and it's not only that, because these three groups, even though they are the most familiar mollusks, are not the only mollusks out there. There are, there are quite a few different, um, there are quite a few other mollusk groups that most people are less familiar with. 
Now, many of them are outside of the group containing the bivalves, gastropods, and cephalopods, these core mollusks. And uh, in fact, the group that unites all three of them is called a uh, conchifera, the ones that have shells, basically. Uh, although that, that's what the name means. But there is a fourth group that is much more poorly known than the big three. Um, so the fourth group of conchiferans are the group that is the focus of the study we're talking about here. Uh, these are the uh, tusk shells, also known as scaphopods. Yeah, I would imagine most people have probably never even heard of tusk shells before. Um, and most of the time, they're not even, you know, you, you can't even find the remains um, a lot of the time just casually walking on the beach like you can with a lot of other mollusks. If you ever collected seashells on the beach, for example, uh, tusk shells are, are quite rare to find, even though they do have shells. Um, so if you want to know what they look like, you, we have two of them pictured on the slide here. In fact, these are the two different species um, that uh, were used in this particular study. And as you can see, uh, tusk shells do indeed have a shell that looks very much like an elephant's tusk. Uh, so I guess there is some kind of connection to the previous story here. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, tusk shells are not very commonly encountered because they tend to live in uh, soft sediments, like far offshore. Uh, so it's very rare for them to get washed up onto the beaches that we frequent, at uh, least mostly. Uh, and their general lifestyle is that they uh, are able to burrow, um, so they use their foot, I guess you could say. Uh, so it's kind of weird to think of mollusks having feet, but uh, at, at the very least, they do have an, a muscular organ um, that they use for locomotion that is technically known as a foot. Um, and in tusk shells, the foot is specialized for burrowing, uh, much like it is in many of the bivalves, actually. Uh, and so they dig themselves into soft sediment and just stay there uh, for pretty much most of their lives. Um, and they have a ring of small tentacles um, that they can use to capture the things they like to eat. And mo mostly that is uh, microscopic organisms living in the sediment with them. And so they have this very, very um, I don't know, low-key lifestyle, I, I guess you could say. Uh, and so they're not often encountered, uh, not even uh, as remains washed up on the beach. And partly as a result of this, they're, they're not that well studied. And therefore, there's definitely a big question here about how are tusk shells related to the other mollusks? Because we can't even agree on how the big three are related. And you throw in this fourth group that we barely studied and you get a big mess basically uh, when it comes to mollusk phylogeny. So the authors of this new paper uh, sequenced genomes from two species of tusk shells. Uh, and so these are the two that are pictured here. And uh, they ran several analyses with these genomes and included uh, you know, Gene, uh, genetic sequences uh, from other types of mollusks as well, including members of the, the big three clades. And what they found was they found very strong and consistent support, like across all of their analyses, that uh, tusk shells seem to be the closest living relatives to bivalves, which is a hypothesis called the diasoma hypothesis. And this is very interesting because Previous genetic studies have not, for most part, supported this result. Uh, now, this idea that the tusk shells are most closely related to clams uh, has actually been proposed in the past, but this was based on their anatomy and not on genetics. And so, in fact, there are quite a few similarities in the anatomy of um, tusk shells and clams. So. Uh, both of them have the shell include enclosing most of the body uh, under regular circumstances. Uh, so, like you, most of the time, you're not going to see a, a a clam like extend very far out of its shell, right? Not, not like a, a slug, uh, well, not not like a snail. Uh, and in addition, uh, they have the they share a burrowing foot, like mentioned earlier, uh, and they also have a very indistinct head. Because again, if you think of what a clam looks like on the inside, the fleshy part of a clam they don't really have a face, right? <laughs> now, they, they technically do have a front and a, and a back. Um, they still do have, like, the anatomical structures for that, but 
yeah, you can't make out a face uh, on a clam. Not like you can with a snail or an octopus. Um, and this the same is mostly true for tusk shells as well. Uh, they do have that little ring of tentacles, which is on their front end, so that you can uh, kind of tell where the head is there. But uh, yeah, it's very indistinct. It's very interesting that this study found uh, genetic evidence to support this hypothesis, because previous genetic studies have generally uh, placed scaphopods instead closer to the gastropods, so to the snails, or to the cephalopods, so the squids and octopuses, um, and not so much to the bivalves. But here, uh, with a lot of genetic data available, they sequence you know, entire genomes for these things. Um, they found strong support instead for this kind of morphology-based hypothesis that the tusk shells and bivalves are close relatives. Um, so that is very cool. Um, they also looked at you know, why has it been so hard to place tusk shells? Uh, why have they been found pretty much all over the map when it comes to their phylogeny? Um, and it turns out that, yes, while they did find um, strong support for this idea that uh, the tusk shells are close to clams, um, if you look at individual genes and not like analyzing the entire sequence, there's actually a lot of conflict when it comes to which genes support which hypotheses. And probably the reason for this is that uh, these major groups of mollusks probably diverge from each other in a relatively short amount of time. And so when this happens, uh, it is often accompanied by a phenomenon called incomplete lineage sorting, where basically you know, the, the ancestors of all these different groups, uh, when they were diverging from each other, were still very similar to each other during that divergence period. Um, and as a result, they probably would have exchanged genes back and forth. Um, with each other, you know, a lot of you, you can think of it as, a, I guess, a lot of hybridization going on at the base of the tree there. And so, uh, in the end, even though in hindsight we can recognize that some groups are more closely related than others, um, it can be very difficult to sort this out when you're just looking at a, a small number of genes because there was so much mixture going on early in their evolutionary history. And we definitely see this a lot with many different groups of organisms where the phylogeny is um, uh, very controversial. Uh, and finally, in, in light of their their new uh, results here, uh, they also tried to estimate how old like each of these uh, uh, mollusk lineages were. And, and based on their um, kind of divergence time analyses, the author suggests that there are certain uh, mysterious Cambrian mollusk specimens um, that should be reevaluated in terms of what type of mollusk they are. Uh, so these include uh, things like Anabarilla and Watsonella and Melopegma. And many of these um, ancient mollusks are known from many different specimens. Uh, mollusk shells are quite easy to preserve as fossils after all. Um, and previously, these particular Cambrian mollusks have been suggested uh, to be either stem tusk shells or stem bivalves. Uh, so basically, they're, they're closely related to either tusk shells or bivalves, but not members of the modern representatives of, of those groups. Um, but in their analyses here, the authors found that the uh, the bivalve and tusk shell divergence probably happened after or later than um, the ages of these early mollusks. And so they suggest that these mollusks may in fact be stem diasomes. So they, they are uh, kind of members of the lineage that would lead up to both of the, both the um, tusk shells and bivalves, uh, but are not members of either of those lineages uh, well, once they had separated. Um, so that that is quite interesting, um, because if it weren't for the fact that uh, this study kind of supported these two as close relatives, uh, we might not uh, think to interpret uh, these early mollusks as like stem diasomes, right? Because we we wouldn't even recognize that as, as a group. Uh, but with this possibility in play, uh, I guess it's time for the mollusk paleontologists to go back and kind of reevaluate uh, the evidence for that. Um, and so, yeah, this is a, a pretty straightforward study, but um, 
I think it, it really sheds light on a very understudied group, and furthermore also helps us sort out the phylogeny of mollusks in general. Um, and so, you know me, I I, I love phylogeny, um, and I love like kind of deep evolutionary um, stories like this. Um, so uh, I, I thought the study was very interesting. Um, what did you think? I certainly agree. Um, I'm always happy to shed more light on kind of underrepresented, unfamiliar groups of organisms, and certainly among mollusks, the tusk shells are that that description. Um, <laughs> I have like a small like shell collection over the years, and I hmm. think I have a tusk shell. Oh wow! Um, when I saw it, I, I recognized it immediately. I'm like, oh hey, this is a weird animal that you don't yeah. usually see. Um, it's a pretty green one too. Um, <laughs> but I imagine like if you ask a lot of people, even like people who are pretty beachy, like hey, you heard of a tusk shell? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they probably, yeah. probably wouldn't know. Um, but I'm glad to see this. Like, so they got whole genomes from these guys, and they plug them into a pretty good phylogeny. Um, although, I am very curious about what more data would do for a study like this. Yeah, um, it, it does seem like compared to the pen, well, to the crustacean study that we talked about last time, um, this is kind of a small collection hmm. of... Uh, mollusks and uh, i'm curious like what more data would do because um i was a little bit familiar with the disoma hypothesis um i have like spent some time in the past looking a little bit at the phylogeny of different organisms and kind of saying where the researchers stood at different points in time right um and i remember reading about that uh, you know regarding the morphological analyses so it's interesting that now we have genetic studies like we now have genetic studies that can back this up um but i'm curious like what the placement of other mollusk groups would do here because i did notice that there are some mollusk groups that are missing mm -hmm. um from the phylogeny uh the ones that stick out in my mind were things like um uh, a plaque of forens. yeah mm -hmm. so these are uh they're kind of wormy mollusks mm -hmm. um they don't have shells but they do have a radula uh, that's kind of shaped like kind of like bitey bits. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, they kind of live out in the, the deep ocean burrows and kind of get food that way. Um, but also in the deep oceans, there are the monoplacophorans, which uh, those do have shells. And uh, apparently they're very... They're very mysterious. Because yeah. um, not only do they live in the deep oceans, we didn't know they existed until like the 50s. Um, and I think the last that I checked, um, monoplacophorans at least, were supposed to be sisters to the cephalopods. Um, and then the aplacophorans were like the most basal or the oldest diverging group of mollusks. You know, it's kind of fit as, you know, a, one of these groups that's allied to the the shelled mollusks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious, like, well, I mean, one thing I guess we have to get genomes from those types of organisms. I don't know how easy that would be, mm -hmm. especially for monoplacophorans. I don't know how common it is to fish those guys up, right. but I wonder, like, having like good genomes of them would do here. Like, would it change the topography gene much? Would uh, would we see some shifting here and there? Um, I don't know, but I'm very curious about it um, because, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're just mysterious organisms. I mean, I'd be hard pressed to think that you'd get more people who know about tusk shells than they do about monoplacophorans <laughs> or uh, <laughs> or aplacophorans. A lot of forens in the musk world. Yes. Um, <laughs> but this is fascinating. This is a great study. I think this is a good step forward. Um, I definitely like what we have now, and uh, yeah, it would be kind of cool to see a, a reanalysis of those Cambrian mollusks, because uh, I know fitting Cambrian mollusks into modern mollusk phylogeny has been pretty tricky, because mm -hmm. um, there are a couple organisms that have widely different interpretations for how they should look mm -hmm. based on their relationship. Um, like this one, I think, is it Nectocaris? I think oh, cool. yeah. oh my god yeah that's a yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we can say that for another day but the, the, that one's been through the ringer 
Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm, I'm afraid to go near it. It's like the Spinosaurus of Cambrian mollusks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, no, this was great. Um, I'm glad you shared this. Um, and uh, we're able to highlight yet another you know, underrepresented group of organisms on our show. Um, I feel like we're getting on a roll with this sort of thing. I'm very happy to see that. <laughs> um, but, alas, to go to a little bit more overrepresented organisms, um, if we move to the next slide, uh, we will begin our October coverage of stories. So, yes, you know, being, being the paleoanthropology lady, I had to pick a paleoanthropology study <laughs> for my October paper. But this one's really nice. Um, and uh, so it also kind of covers something that we've talked about before, like on you know the old uh, Humanity of Prologue series that I did. Um, so an emerging trend in very recent years in paleoanthropology is the understanding of Homo sapiens as a generalist specialist. So this is described in a key paper from 2018 by Patrick Roberts and Brian A. Stewart. Quote, not only did it, aka we, um, occupy and utilize a diversity of environments, but we also specialize in its adaptation to some of these environmental extremes. So we kind of have a simultaneous plasticity and specialization in a wide range of environments more and more researchers have been finding that our species did not emerge in a singular dry savanna environment as you know old research has tried to show but that we seem to have thrived in other ecosystems as diverse as rainforests and wetlands so a key question remains when did this niche arise are we the pioneer species of hominin that first became generalist specialists or were there earlier species that set the stage? And so here's a paper from uh, Tegan I.F. Oyster and colleagues that set out to investigate this question by exploring a period of time between 2 million years ago and 800,000 years ago. So that's from the time when the genus Homo first emerged to when braided speciation began to distinguish the ancestors of ourselves, Homo sapiens, from Neanderthals and Denisovans. And they surveyed 74 archaeological sites associated with hominin remains or technologies and broke down 121 reconstructions of their environments that had been previously published. And with this information at hand, the team could see whether early species like, say, Homo erectus were tied to just one type of specific ecosystem or whether they ranged as widely as we did. So in the past, the paleoanthropologists had proposed the Savannistan hypothesis, in which the expansion of grasslands in Africa and beyond to Eurasia, which you know, previously influenced proboscidean evolution, as we uh, talked about earlier in the series in the show, um, provided a network of corridors that helped early Homo expand across the continents, where before forests and wetlands were supposed to have acted as barriers. This was argued to be so strong that the supposed delayed expansion of hominins into Europe and the extinction of Homo erectus in Southeast Asia was supposed to be attributed to the presence of woodlands at the expense of grasslands. In the years since this hypothesis was first proposed, there have been many doubts placed on the Savannistan model. For one, some sites where Homo remains had been found were since shown through better analyses to have been wetter and more vegetated than previously thought. Uh, Ubadia in Israel, for example, is one of the earliest localities in Eurasia where hominins have been found. And rather than being a savanna, recent work has found it to be a woodland forest. And a similar situation goes for the oldest hominin sites in Europe, too. So it seems that species like Homo erectus and its kindred were probably far more adaptable to different environments than we just previously suspected. Um, and so this paper is kind of a way to really try to hone that in, see if there's something to that information that we've been getting already. So you know, despite the dearth of hominin sites in many regions of the world, things like West Africa, and Central Eurasia, the team were able to survey as wide a swath of hominin sites as possible. 
habitats were divided as reasonably um, as the paper required uh, so as to not bias the results and kind of keep confusion at bay because different publications describe habitats in different ways. So the team divided everything into wetlands, grasslands, shrublands, mixed environments, woodlands, and forests. And each of those have distinct subsets in each. So savannas would be classified in the mixed category because not all savannas were open, dry plains. Some were actually fairly wooded, or at least shrubby. Um, closed, dense, or closed canopy vegetation is classified under the forest category. And woody vegetation encompasses the woodland category. So I guess there's a distinction between a woodland and a forest. Ecology is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, these were given scores based on the relative weight of the environmental data towards one category or another. The team had to put a final category to each site that they surveyed. Otherwise, they it would be too complicated. Um, the team also gave a calculation for tree affinity based on the importance of trees in a habitat as opposed to other plant life. Because again, this is a big factor in the savanna stand hypothesis. Areas where there are not a lot of trees were supposed to have been beneficial to our species and its ancestors. And so all this together gave the information needed to place a given hominin in a specific environmental context to give us our full picture of hominin ecological diversity. And lo and behold, the results of this complex analysis indicate that early Homo did tend to frequent grasslands and savanna type environments. But sure enough, this was not the exclusive habitat that the old savanna stand model argued for. Six out of the 121 habitat reconstructions were for fully forested habitats, and another eight of these had forests occupying the largest shares of the land. Hominins were found in wet as well as dry environments and in closed as well as in open vegetation patterns. So it does seem that indeed, long before our species evolved, hominins were already somewhat ecologically flexible. And in fact, the results indicated far more than this. So while the old Savannistan model argued that it was the expanding grassland corridors that helped hominins disperse into Eurasia for the first time, the variation of the habitats that we see actually indicate that this long-term event was rather a niche expansion rather than a retaining of niche speciality. Hmm. The tree affinity calculations show that the range of vegetation types in Eurasian habitats was even greater than that in Africa. So, like, for example, uh, the previous hypothesis that Homo erectus died out in Southeast Asia because of expanding forests at the expense of grasslands, we now know, or at least we can be fairly sure, is a highly unlikely model. And we would have to have other factors that would need to be sought out to explain why the species died off there about 100,000 years ago. And so it goes. Um, of course, we have species like Homo floresiensis, which is known from later remains that you know, is found in a wooded environment on the island of Flores. So clearly, um, different hominins were even specializing in environments as well as expanding their niches. The increase in morphological diversity in Eurasian hominins that preceded the rise of our species and its closest relatives might even have been a result of this niche expansion. I mean, the timing is right for when we start to find new hominins beyond the classic Homo erectus morphology, which can be explained by specialization into so many new and different habitats in Eurasia. And I mean, really, at the end of the day, our analyses are only as good as the data we have. Mm -hmm. Again, to kind of piggyback off what we discussed in my first story today, you know, it, it may be that the dearth of hominin sites from the majority of the African continent and beyond may have prevented researchers from fully understanding the situation of human evolution in those parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, quality fossils can only be formed in the right kinds of conditions, right? The acidic soils of rainforests or the increased risk of scavenging in certain open environments don't preserve skeletal remains all that well. 
And the researchers behind the study spend a lot of time in their discussion explaining these factors and how they can impact the data. Mm -hmm. You know, the, this priority of sites in southern and eastern Africa seems to have actually hindered study because researchers have been more focused on looking there than in places like the western half of the continent. Mm -hmm. So really, who knows what the future will hold? I mean, maybe some of these groundbreaking, uh, groundbreaking discoveries in paleoanthropology, you know, the things that really shift focus and change the data's interpretation like what we've seen here, might be found in those parts of the world. Um, but either way, it, it seems certain now that, at least for the early Eurasian dispersals of hominins, we're looking at a situation where you know, hominins, like almost from the beginning of the genus Homo, were experimenting with so many different environments, adjusting very well to local conditions, utilizing resources properly, that they were probably more, even more of a force on the landscape than we might be suspecting, mm -hmm. which we've certainly talked about before in the past. And uh, it, would be interesting, it would be interesting to see you know, further analyses inspired by this research into that subject. But uh, I just thought I had to share this. Um, it's kind of interesting to see the, sort of the parallels between elephants and hominins, um, especially regarding the Eurasian dispersals, because really both species kind of followed a similar path. Yeah. Um, much of proboscidean evolution started in Africa, and then those groups dispersed out of the continent several times to settle in other parts of the world and diversify there, which is exactly what we did, mm -hmm. um, just on different time scales. that is. Yeah. Um, so it's neat to compare those two results. Um, yeah, what did you think of this paper, buddy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it is kind of funny how um, you, you ended up picking like two papers that were so uh, thematically uh, similar and uh, not, uh, not, not just even thematically similar, but the point could even be made that hominins and proboscideans have actually directly interacted with each other uh, throughout the course uh, of their evolutionary history. And we actually have evidence of that. So it is, it is very fun to see the parallels um, here. I don't have too much to, to add that I didn't already say for the previous paper, but again, this looks like a very um, thorough amount of work um, and a lot of a lot of data collected. Um, and obviously, as you and the authors say, uh, new data may change things uh, and we, we can only work with what we have and all that, but uh, within the framework of what we do have here, and it looks like we have quite a, quite a lot. Um, I think this uh, this paints a really illuminating picture of, of human evolution, um, and, and it does make a lot of sense that uh, early Homo were so ecologically flexible. Because obviously, if you think about um, how widespread things like Homo erectus were uh, and the number of different environments that they must have encountered, I I think uh, I, I think it stands to reason that th this would be the case, and it's a it's good to um, to get more support for that from this kind of very uh, rigorous and quantitative perspective. Um, so yes, very, very cool. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. Um, well, in that case, that's all I really had to say about this paper. Um, shall we move on to our final story for October? Uh, sure, we can do that. <laughs> so for this one, uh, I think uh, it's going to be quite interesting. And I, I guess uh, this is my uh, kind of in-character pick, where it's like, uh, I'm going to talk about a story about birds. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I think it's a, it's a type of story that we haven't really talked about much, I, I think. Um, so th this will be interesting. Um, so in this story, we're going to talk about um, mirrors and how animals react to them, because I, I think... Uh, you know, mirrors are something that we tend to take for granted, right? I, I, I think many of us, probably most of us who are listening to this show, um, use mirrors on pretty much a daily basis. They are they're tools that are just like inextricably linked to to our lives. Uh, but like, have you ever considered what it would be like to not know what a mirror is or what it represents? Because um, that actually reminds me of um, a story in uh, Doraemon, um, 
which is a franchise that we talked about a few episodes back a few months ago so you can go check that out if you want to know more about it um but uh for for those who aren't familiar uh, doraemon is a, a japanese um anime and manga series which is about uh, a robotic cat from the future who comes who travels back in time to help uh, an elementary school kid who is the main character um and uh, Doraemon has all these gadgets that he keeps in his pocket um, from the future, uh, and he uses these gadgets to try and help the main character out with his daily problems. Um, and I, I swear there's a point to this. Um, so in, in one of the stories, um, basically the, the main character gets the idea of uh, what if we lived in a world without any mirrors, and that way nobody would ever have to feel bad about their own appearance, because nobody would know what they themselves look like. And uh, Doraemon has this gadget, which is, it's basically shaped like a phone booth, and you speak into the phone if you want to uh, test out what uh, sort of alternate reality would look like. Uh, you can specify um, what, what you want to see. So you can say, I want, a, I want a, um, a world without mirrors. Um, and uh, so that that's what he does. And uh, when they exit the phone booth, like the, the world has changed. Like there are no there are no mirrors, no reflections of any kind. Um, and our part way through the story, uh, the main character then gets the idea: What if we introduced mirrors to the people living in this universe who have never seen a mirror before? And then uh, so they they do, and uh, a lot of like comedy and chaos ensues because none of the people know what a mirror is, and so they assume that their own reflection is another person and try to interact with that person in different ways, um, which leads to a lot of hilarity. Uh, but but in any case, uh, obviously in, in our world, uh, most people know what mirrors are, but a lot of non-human animals are not familiar with the concept of mirrors, right? Like mo most of the time in, uh, in the wild, there, there would never be any situation where they would be able to see their own reflection, at least not at least so clearly. Um, and so there is this classic uh, test in... Um, uh, in studying animal cognition, uh, trying to see how animals react to mirrors as a way of gauging how uh, self-aware they are. Like, you know, can they figure out that the reflection in the mirror represents themselves? And the classic way of testing this, uh, it's often called the mirror test, or more more specifically, because uh, as we'll as we'll see, there are uh, other ways of determining or or at least uh, studying animal interactions with with mirrors. Um, but more specifically, uh, the mark test is a classic test that has often been used to try and figure out um, the self awareness of, of animals from this perspective, um, and basically. Uh, in the mark test, uh, researchers apply some kind of marking, like using using paint, for example, uh, to an animal, um, and then expose them to a mirror. And the idea is that if if the animal is capable of mirror self recognition, uh, then they will notice that they have this mark on them, and you know it, it's going to be placed in the in the part of the body where they would otherwise not be able to see except by looking at the reflection. Um, and then if the animal reacts to that mark uh, upon seeing its reflection, um, that is used as evidence to suggest that these animals are capable of understanding uh, like mirror reflections or, um, and therefore have like some, some degree of self-awareness. And so uh, a number of different uh, species um, have been reported to pass the mark test. Um, these include most of the great ape species, uh, also bottlenose dolphins, Asian elephants, uh, some types of corvids, uh, specifically Indian house crows, and maybe Eurasian magpies, although that study was a little controversial. Um, and perhaps more surprisingly, um, cleaner wrasses, which are a type of fish um, that uh, they, they are specialized for cleaning the parasites off 
other species of fish. So they're actually really interesting. Um, and I, I, I kind of hope that we get to talk about a story about cleaner races on the show sometime, because uh, they're, they're extremely fascinating in terms of like their, their ecology and their interactions with other species. But in any case, uh, there, there have been a couple of studies that have reported evidence that cleaner races um, might actually be capable of mirror self-recognition. Um, and the species that is most distantly related to us that has been reported um, to possess mirror self-recognition um, are uh, manta rays, uh, which is also probably quite a big surprise, although that study has been subject to criticism as well. Um, but in any case, uh, we're looking at a relatively small selection of species here. Uh, a far greater number of species have uh, been reported to fail the mark test. Um, as you can see, uh, there aren't that, that many birds in that list, right? There are one or two uh, types of corvids, which are incredibly smart birds by, by most standards. Um, but most other types of birds have not passed the mark test. Uh, and even many other species of corvids and uh, parrots have not passed the mark test, even though uh, by pretty much all other metrics of intelligence, they would be considered extremely intelligent. Um, so well, what is going on? I, well, of course, one possibility is that obviously there, there are different types of intelligence, right? So an animal that's good at one thing might not be uh, so cognitively uh, developed in another. Um, uh, but the, the mark test in general has also been subject to various critiques when it comes to um, how reliable it is as a test of self-awareness. Uh, for one thing, there is a high variation there's a large amount of variation in the success rate in terms of uh, uh, these tests. Like e even in species that pass the mark test, uh, there are often only a few individuals who uh, clearly demonstrate self-awareness and others that don't. And like, what's going on there? Like, is it that some of them are self-aware and others aren't? Uh, I mean, that, that might be possible in some cases, but uh, it, it seems more likely that since this is a pattern that is seen across the board, that it, it, this test is simply a test that uh, often gives you what, what we call false negative results. So you you'll you'll get cases um, you'll get results that make it seem like um, the animal lacks mirror self recognition when perhaps it does and just did not display it under those particular circumstances. Um, and in fact, um, a, a very strong point in favor of this idea um, is that. Even in humans, uh, there is actually high variation in success of the mark test. Now, of course, um, in these cases, uh, people have done experiments testing uh, children who are um, uh, about 18 months old or so. Um, most people who grow up in societies uh, where mirrors are commonplace um, are able to recognize themselves in the mirror from 18 months onward. Um, but people have also done experiments with um, uh, folks who live in cultures that uh, do not use mirrors on a regular basis. And in those cases, you, you get this high variation in success rate um, in young children, uh, similar to what you see in, in many of these uh, non-human animals that have also passed the mark test. Um, so that, that suggests that you know the, this mark test is not necessarily a very intuitive thing for, for a lot of animals and maybe not even uh, a lot of humans. And furthermore, some animals that normally don't pass the mark test can be trained to pass the mark test. Um, and by, by that, I don't mean that they, you know, you, you just you train them to do this particular trick that they they learn to pass the, the mark test. But instead, like, if, if you show them through other ways, like what a mirror is, they they will and they will be able to use the mirror to like do things. Um, like they, they might even check themselves in the mirror to, to check uh, if, if they're stirred on themselves or things like that, or, or use mirrors to find hidden objects that they wouldn't be able to find otherwise um, if they undergo some training with the mirror. Um, but if you just expose to the mirror to them and try to let them figure it out by themselves, they, they don't pass the mark test in that case. But you know, it, it can only, it only takes like a relatively simple training exercise to get them to do so. And this has been found to be the case in some types of monkeys, for example, like macaques. Um, and there's also the fact that 
uh, some species might just not view the markings as a big deal. So even if they see themselves at that mark in in their own reflection, they might not really think anything of it, basically, and not really have any impulse to get rid of it, uh, as you might imagine. Um, and so in, if that's the case, then they would fail the mark test, even if they were uh, capable of mirror self-recognition. And then there's also the fact that these types of traits in the animal world are rarely a simple dichotomy, right? Uh, it's, it's not so much, uh, or it, it may not so much be that uh, there are animals that recognize themselves in the mirror versus those that don't. Um, it's possible that animals might exhibit a gradient of understanding of what a reflection is. Um, and that, that is kind of um, also echoed by the, the point made earlier about how some animals can be trained to, to pass the mark test. Um, and so, for example, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, parrots so far uh, haven't, uh, in controlled conditions, been demonstrated to pass the mark test. Uh, but uh, parrots can figure out how to use the mirror to kind of examine their own surroundings and look for hidden items, kind of like what I described earlier. Um, so it's possible that they, you know, they just don't use the mirror as a way to examine themselves, uh, but they might still have some understanding of what a reflection is. So all, all that is to say that uh, the authors of this study decided to test um, chickens uh, and their mirror self-recognition abilities. But in a very different way, um, like in addition to the mark test. Um, so they chose chickens for this partly because, well, in general, chickens aren't considered very smart birds, right? Um, I, like, I, I'm sure they are smarter than most people give them credit for, but you know, compared to something like a corvid or a parrot, like it, there's a lot less obvious, you know, complex cognition going on uh, with chickens. Um, and for another, because they want to test this idea that the nature of the test can influence the um, animal's uh, performance regarding the mirror test, because it's not really a natural situation for an animal to have to look at itself in the mirror, or for most wild animals to look, look at themselves in the mirror and like, clean themselves off or something, which is what the mark test expects them to do. Um, what if we try to simulate a situation where an animal encounters a mirror in a situation that they would normally encounter going about their daily lives? And so that, that's the kind of line of thinking that the authors of this paper decided to, to um, pursue. Um, so they did test their chickens uh, on the mark test, and it turns out that the chickens failed the mark test. Um, and uh, I guess just to describe the experimental setup there, uh, basically, so the, these chickens had never encountered mirrors before, um, and they were tested under four different conditions. So uh, they applied uh, kind of colored powder to the chickens, like just underneath their uh, their waddles. So, you know, the dangly, fleshy bits under the uh, the neck of a chicken. Um, and so they, they applied a, a colored powder to that region of the body there to a chicken, uh, and then exposed them to a mirror to see um, what would happen if the, if the chickens would, would react to seeing the, the mark in their reflection. Um, and for comparison, they also um, applied a transparent powder to the to the same area and then exposed the chickens to the mirror. And so this is to um, test to see, you know, if, if the chicken would examine themselves more just because they had been touched in that region and not it's not because of the powder or anything. So had to control for that variable. Um, and then there's the um, a setup where they applied the colored mark, but had no mirror, so the chicken couldn't see itself in the reflection. Um, and then a transparent mark and no mirror um, for a fourth setup. And then basically there, there was no clear difference when there was a mirror and a colored mark. So the chickens weren't using their own reflections to uh, kind of clean, clean off the mark, essentially. Um, so, okay, chickens don't pass the classic mark test, but what if we try a different experimental setup? Um, so the authors uh, tried a different test, what they call mirror audience test. And this is based on the idea that, uh, you know, 
in their day-to-day -day lives, if a chicken is out foraging, and they, they tested roosters specifically, so if a rooster is out uh, with the rest of its flock, um, if they were out foraging uh, and the rooster spotted a predator um, and the other chickens were nearby, the rooster would make an alarm call and warn the other chickens. But if the rooster was foraging alone, uh, they are much less likely to give an alarm call, because if they did give an alarm call, they would draw attention to themselves um, for the predator, right? And so uh, if there is no reason to give an alarm call, if there's no one else around to warn, uh, chickens tend to stay quiet if they see a predator instead. Uh, so uh, based on this idea, um, the authors set up the experimental um, setup that is pictured here on this slide. Um, so basically, uh, again, they tested four different situations. So in one situation, um, the chicken uh, was put into this room, and every now and then they would project the um, silhouette of a bird of prey on the ceiling. And so, so in the, the letter A, the top left here, uh, that is the chicken um, with no mirror and no other chickens around. Um, so under normal circumstances, the chicken probably would not make an alarm call in this situation. Uh, the um, setup B um, is that the chicken was alone in, in this setup, but there was a mirror in the room, so it could see its own reflection, and then they wanted to test what would happen if they projected the bird of prey uh, silhouette again. Um, the third experimental setup was that uh, there was another rooster in kind of the, the room next to the uh, to the rooster being tested on. And so the rooster could see that there was another chicken with it. And under natural circumstances, the chicken would make an alarm call um, if it saw a predator in this situation, um, or is more likely to at least. Um, also, uh, for the record, the, the other chicken that was not being tested on could not see the, the first chicken, um, so it, it would not make an alarm call. Um, but uh, yeah, just just to just to make make that clear. Um, and finally, um, there was a situation where there was a mirror and another chicken in the other room, but the chicken being tested could only see its own reflection. And the reason they introduced this particular setup was to see if the um, the chicken could detect the other chicken through other senses that was not by sight in this setup. So maybe you could hear the other chicken or smell the other chicken, and therefore it would still give a, an alarm call. Uh, maybe uh, they had to test for that possibility. Um, so as it turns out, out of all these, um, out of these four experimental setups, the only situation uh, in which the chickens were likely to make alarm calls was when they could see another chicken in the other room um, uh, with them. So they did not make alarm calls, or, or were very unlikely to make alarm calls when they were alone. Um, and they were very unlikely to when they could only see their own reflection, whether or not there was another chicken uh, in the next room. Um, and so this is really interesting. So evidently, uh, at least according to these experimental results, uh, they don't treat the reflection any differently from, or at least they don't behave any differently with the reflection in the room with them compared to how they would when they were alone. Um, and so evidently they don't see the reflection as like just another chicken uh, that they that they have to warn. Um, and so this is interesting for a number of reasons. So, I mean, the result itself is pretty interesting that you, you can get this kind of substantial difference in how the chicken was treating its own reflection based on this experimental setup. Um, but also, uh, this these results actually um, are similar to results that were done in a previous study on California scrub jays. Um, basically, scrub jays have this habit, and scrub jays are corvids, of course, so they're, they're very smart birds. Um, but basically, they, they have this habit of um, storing food, and if they know that they are being watched by another scrub jay, they will actually like pretend to store food to kind of throw the other scrub jay off because they like to steal from each other. Um, and so uh, a previous study did a uh, kind of similar uh, experiment to this with scrub jays, where uh, scrub jays didn't seem to pass the mark test, but they still evidently didn't treat their own reflection as like a regular old 
color scrub jay um because they would not like exhibit unusual like food storage behavior um in the presence of their own reflection and so it's very similar to what we see going on with these chickens and so and does this demonstrate that chickens are capable of mirror self-reflection? Well, not necessarily. Like the, the authors do suggest that there, there's an al alternative explanation that maybe the chicken kind of viewed the reflection as a weird chicken that, that was like copying all their own movements. And so uh, they, they knew like something was off about it. And so didn't kind of didn't really see it as a regular um, member of their own species. And maybe therefore were, were not like motivated to, to warn it, um, which is possible. I mean, I, I think it's going to be very difficult to like really demonstrate what, what's going on inside a chicken's head. Right. Um, but it does show that, the mark test is not really the end all be all of showing how animals react to their own reflection. And it also raises the importance of how tests like these should be tailored to what an animal does like in its day to day life. I, I guess there, there's a classic saying about how if you um, if you test a fish on its ability to climb a tree, you're going to think the fish is stupid, I guess, unless it's a mudskipper, I suppose. Um, it, when, when testing animal intelligence, uh, it is important to kind of um, tailor it in a way um, that suits the, the way that the animal is likely to, to think um, and not perhaps how we are likely to think. And, of course, it also kind of adds to the the growing amount of evidence that self-recognition uh, can be considered more of a spectrum and not so much a simple dichotomy. So whether or not chickens actually recognize themselves in the mirror, um, it, it is evident that they they don't necessarily mistake the reflection for just a regular other chicken. Um, and so, you know, who, who knows what's what they're actually thinking, but I, I think uh, um, they make a very good point here that these types of uh, studies should should pay close attention to their experimental design. Uh, actually, this just reminded me that at the uh, Cincinnati Zoo, uh, where, which I visited during SVP, many of the animal exhibits had mirrors in them as kind of animal enrichment, I guess, and including in some of the bird exhibits. Um, so I, yeah, I, I you know, I, I I don't know what the animals necessarily make of the mirrors, but uh, it, it is kind of interesting that. They, they were using that as um, a way to make the animals' you know, lives more interesting. <laughs> um, but in any case, I think that's pretty much all I have to say about this story. Uh, do you have any thoughts, Dan? I'm very intrigued with this paper. Um, because on the one hand, yeah, it would be an interesting like point in the favor of chickens having self-recognition if it's only like giving warning calls to like other chickens that it knows is another chicken versus mm -hmm. like seeing reflection. But on the other hand, you know, that, that alternative explanation for what might be going on here would raise some very interesting points, in my opinion. Um, you know, in how the maybe the 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 chicken in the study sees this reflection as like another weird chicken and so just does not connect with it in that way. Right. Um I wonder you know, if that does turn out to be the case, which again, like you said, and we must stress that we can't never, we can never really fully know that for sure. Um, it would be interesting to note that that would essentially be a case of a chicken not having like empathy for like other different members of its type. Right. If right. That makes sense. Cause like, I mean, obviously, if it thinks it's a weird chicken that's copying all its movements and it doesn't, like, give out a warning call when a bird of prey is coming by, like, that would be, like, bad for the weird chicken, in its opinion, if it happened to be a living entity, right? <laughs> right. Because, like, I think about, you know, in, in nature documentaries and books that I've read, like, there are plenty of cases of, like, across species boundaries where, like, yes. one animal is a sentry looking out for like maybe three or four other completely different species of organisms mm -hmm. whenever there's a predator nearby you know it makes the call and everybody flees but here we, we get a chicken 
sees another weird ch chicken or what, what, what it thinks is another weird chicken is like does not warn it when danger's nearby <laughs> it's like that's that's on you buddy i'm getting out of here um <laughs> I don't know. My, my mind just went to that. It, it it would be interesting. I don't know um, to think that that's the case. Because uh, yeah, I guess did the. Well, I'm sure the paper did say this, but like this is just like a regular like barnyard like chicken, right? This isn't like a uh, like a factory farm chicken or a or like somebody's pet chicken or. A petting zoo chicken or anything like that. Yeah, they, so they they tested a lot of different individual chickens um, to to get the results, but but yeah, like these were these are barnyard chickens as far as I know. Okay, interesting. So yeah, I would think like those would be the chickens that would like be a little bit more comfortable around other types of birds. Hmm. Um, goodness knows my neighbors; they keep a lot of different <laughs> birds together. Hmm. Um, you know, they have the chickens hanging out with the geese and the guinea fowl yeah. and the turkeys. Right. Um, and they all kind of they all kind of crash together in that way. So, yeah, th this is just curious to me, like if that alternative explanation happens to have a little bit more weight. Um, but yeah, again, on the other hand, like that's that's a pretty interesting case for chickens maybe having mirror self recognition. Um, so I would think out of all the varied organisms that. You know there are that have done the mirror test I, I i my first thoughts would not be chickens right um gosh i just have so many thoughts um but at the risk of me rambling on and on um i do like like kind of like one of the the end lessons from the study that mm -hmm. you know we should probably be tailoring these cognitive tests to the animal's biology and ecology in order for it to to have more like meaningful results. Right. Um, I really appreciated seeing that here. And I, I, I think once that's done more frequently with other types of organisms, we might mm -hmm. be getting a whole bunch of new research that we couldn't even really have thought of before. Yeah, absolutely. And I certainly look, I certainly would look forward to that. <laughs> um, but this is great. This is a great paper. <laughs> um, was there anything else you wanted to add about? Oh, uh, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think we can we can jump ahead. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so that is it then for our September and October news stories. We want to thank you all for tuning in and, and following us on these fascinating papers. Um, moving on to our usual end material on the next slide. Um, we are on Patreon. So that's patreon.com forward slash time and clades. If you are so interested in wanting to support us with any monetary amount, you could go on there. We have a tier system and uh, whatever contributions you provide would help us continue the series and develop new projects and expansions. Um, we're at a point now where we have six patrons that are on a tier where they are owed shout outs. So we want to give a big thanks to my sister, Julie, and our friends, Paul, Denver, Tristan, Frankish, and Val Denunzio. So we want to thank you all for your contributions for the show. Um, in terms of general acknowledgments, we want to thank our good friends Henry and Alicia for their contributions to the series. Um, Henry, of course, is responsible for the theme music that opens each episode, and Alicia is responsible for the color scheme of Albert's Alvarosaur avatar. Um, and I do want to make a quick small acknowledgement to my partner, Alari. Mm -hmm. So besides having a thematic connection between my September and October news stories, um, there's also like a more of a personal connection because both of these papers are were made at least in part in some cases through researchers at the Department of Geosciences and Geography at the University of Helsinki, Finland, which is where Alari is based at. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Juha Serinen, who was responsible in part for the Proboscidean paper, is his supervisor oh, wow. and the assistant professor of the geology department there. And so Olari clued me into these papers, and I thought, well, they match the months that we're covering, and they're fascinating topics in of themselves. So I thought, why not? I'll include them both and kind of highlight the work that the um, University of Helsinki and Associates has been conducting with. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I wanted to thank my partner again for, for giving me the heads up. I know you'll be watching, and so thank you again, mm -hmm. uh, my dear. Um, and of course, uh, moving on to the next slide, um, we are on Twitter still. Uh, we are at Time and Clades. 
Um, usually we are on there um, sharing new episodes when they are announced and also just providing general announcements as well. But most likely you're watching us on our YouTube page through Time and Play. So if you're interested in liking and subscribing, um, we certainly appreciate any and all support. If you have any questions for our show, whether that would be about the papers that we covered or just anything in general, uh, there are three ways to contact us. You can send us an email, timeandclades at gmail.com. You can tweet at us, or you can uh, leave a comment below in the YouTube section, and uh, we will almost certainly get to those and answer in a timely manner. Um, and of course, if you want to check out the papers that we featured today or any other uh, um, references that we've mentioned, we, they are listed below in the description for your convenience. Um, but with that, that is it for our show. Um, in terms of what is going on next, um, all I can really say for certain is that we will continue providing news content. Um, now that it's approaching winter time and mm. some, of the, some of the more you know extensive holiday seasons, um, I don't know how that will affect our output, right. but uh, we're certainly going to be keeping in touch and discussing how we want to continue the show as well. Um, but until then, we look forward to seeing you all again for the next time, and we hope you all have a wonderful day. Yeah, take care, everybody. <laughs>